going on, guys? And welcome back to the Edison Club podcast. I'm your host, Mike. Coming at you today with one of my solo podcast episodes, which I have been known to do from time to time. Originally, this was going to be formatted as an actual YouTube video, but I didn't really want to do it as like an eighth grade PowerPoint slideshow type thing. And it's just a lot of information to be said. And I kind of just felt like I needed a outlet to just old man ramble about this for quite some time. This will probably be the longest podcast episode that I have recorded to date. And uh, this podcast episode is actually going to be about how you can get better at Edison format. Because truthfully, sorry, that's my alarm. It's time to wake up. Truthfully, if I can do it, then anyone can do it. Because my self-esteem and my confidence in the format were at an all-time low not that long ago. So I'll go over a brief history of my Edison format experience. Started playing back in 2022 and really thought that after playing advanced format Yu-Gi-Oh for so long that I could kind of just jump into this format, you know, head first and just be very, very good at it. And that's actually just not the case. And I didn't actually learn that until much later on just how much of a learning curve that there is going from advanced to Edison format. So my first several tournaments that I played in, I actually did terrible, terrible, terrible. I actually remember the first few, I got 2 out every round. And that's rough when you go from playing advanced format and feeling like you can't win, feeling like you're not good enough, to playing a format that you do actually feel confident in, even if it's just fake confidence, and then doing poor in that format as well. Also, guys, quick disclaimer here. I am kind of choked up this morning. I'm not sure if I'm coming down with something or what, but uh, you might hear intermediate pauses, so I'm not coughing into my microphone. But that was an eye-opener, not doing very well in a format that I thought I would. But I kept going, and I kept going, and we went to a tournament in Pennsylvania earlier this year in February. And that was after Christia Sworn had actually just either topped or won something. James Art was piloting it. So I built his list card for card. I was like, okay, obviously it was just a problem with the list. So I built it and I went 0 5. I actually lost to someone. It was their first time playing Edison format. And I hate when people tell me that and I lose to them. It's very disappointing. So after that, I really kind of spiraled very, very badly. I felt as if, I actually felt as if the hobby that I invested in my whole life was just not my thing. I had every intention of just hanging up the gloves and just being done because I just felt like it was the universe telling me that my time had come and that was just it for me. That was supposed to be the end. So I actually sold my old T Heralds, I sold my secret Christias, and I was getting very close to selling all of my cards everything because I was just I wanted to just be done. I was just so down and depressed about it. I wanted to be done. And I ended up keeping Pure Light Sworn. And my friend Justin and my friend Blake kind of talked me into like, okay, well if Christy is not working out for you, why don't you just play Pure Light Sworn? So I go off on this tangent <clears throat> for probably three months and just saying Christy is sworn sucks. That deck that deck is not real. That deck is very bad. And I actually even remember a few times just saying James Ark got lucky. And looking back now, I'm just like, wow, I was an idiot. Like, say that James Ark, the Yu-Gi-Oh, one of the Yu-Gi-Oh goats, you know, just got lucky. But we'll, 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 we'll get to more of that later on. But my, what I always say my breakthrough tournament was we went to a tournament at the side deck in South Carolina. And I got sixth place, which they did top eight out of like 16 people. So it's actually not that big of an accomplishment. But when you go from bombing every tournament you play in to getting sixth place and like getting that little title of like, oh, quote unquote, top eight, it's a little bit of a confidence booster. And it was a confidence booster for me. So that tournament was what made me realize like, hey, maybe I can actually do this. So um, I'm in the tank with Pure Light Sworn, and that's what I dedicate all of my time to is Pure Light Sworn. I'm still on this thing. Oh, Christia Sworn sucks. James Art got lucky. Anybody that plays Christia Sworn is just a sack, you know. And I have that mentality for a while. And even going up into the BBG 5K that they hosted way back early this year, 
I'm sorry, the PBG 2K that they hosted early this year. And I play Pure Light Sworn there. And I actually do really good throughout that tournament run. I only lost to Raikoko twice. It was both of my losses that day. I lost to him in Swiss and in top eight. And to me, that was like the accomplishment of a lifetime. I was like, wow, I actually got into the top eight. I think I was third or fourth seat at the end of Swiss. So like the way VBG did it was they did top 12, first through eight. I'm sorry, the first four didn't have to play the top eight round. You just immediately got put up into the next round. And that was a good feeling. I was like, I like this feeling. Like I want this feeling all the time. And <clears throat> I played my top top cut match against Prescott. I guess it was top four against Prescott Raikoko. And I can still think back to it. It's like PTSD, like helicopters crashing in my brain. But I, I pitched a smashing ground off of a monster reincarnation instead of a shield crush. And that ultimately cost me the game in game three. Or I might would have beat Prescott in top four, which would have been insane for me. But <clears throat> I had people around me saying like, wow, Boyd goes from being at the last table to, you know, battling out with Raikoko at table one. And that was a good feeling. So yet again, just a little bit of confidence here and there. Just a little bit of a confidence booster. So after the 2K, I was like, okay, no matter what happens, no matter how many good runs I have, no matter how many bad runs I have, I know that I have the capability to get here now. And that was that was ingrained in my brain. Like, I knew that I could get there now. I still said Christia Sworn sucked, by the way. I was still on the train that Christia Sworn was, in fact, not good. I did not agree with anyone, okay? And I was just blaming the deck for my own incompetence, I guess. So the 2K goes on, and I can't remember what happened between there and, like, a few other tournaments. I did switch to Frogs. For a little while because I really liked Frazier's Frog Monarch list that he piloted at that same 2k and that was a deck that I just really liked it's just a lot of fun you get to play frogs you get to play monarchs you get to play a lot of cards you wouldn't normally get to play with like the Stalos and I actually did win a Nintendo Switch with Frazier's Frog deck card for card exactly how he built it I want to switch that way and um, sometime after that, I revisit Light Sworn, Pure Light Sworn again, and I do win a Nintendo Switch at Picante, and that was after I beat Raikoko, so I got my, um, got my revenge at that Switch tournament. So it's like, you can kind of see, little by, excuse me, little by little, kind of moving up the totem pole, slowly, just slowly climbing, and I didn't ever say I was going to quit playing Light Sworn. I did, like I said, play a couple other things just here and there, but I never really deviated too far away from it. Well, at some point, Times 2, who is a god among men when it comes to playing Light Sworn, he got top 16 at RBT Marino Valley. And in his deck, he played a lot of new cards. <clears throat> he played things like Graganith, Light Sworn Dragon. He played Glorious Illusion. And these were all cards that, up to that point, no one had even considered playing those cards in their deck, myself included. I actually looked at Glorious Illusion a few times, and I was like, this card's not an high impact enough to warrant playing. But it was because that card is mainly good paired with Graganith because it gives you an alternate win condition. So I start testing that deck, and I can't remember at that time if it was pure or if it was Christia. Um, actually, I do remember it was pure because I played his exact list card for card at the first Ultimate Time Wizard in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I actually feel like I could have done well. I threw my last round um, against this guy named Ernie who was on Value Turbo. And Ernie actually went on to win the Giant Minerva at YCS Richmond a couple days ago, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago now, whatever it was. So uh that, that was a good loss you know after after him winning richmond i was like okay you know what that's fine he was an excellent player but uh so i did pilot his deck for nats and then i think at the next one he played christia sworn and he completely just reinvented all of the ratios of that deck he dropped soul of purity and light down to two he dropped archlord christia down to two 
Uh, he played Glorious Illusion. I think he played, I think he played Genis, Lightsworn Mender, instead of Gragoneth in that list. But I was like, okay, you know, maybe Christius Sworn is actually good. So I decide I'm going to give it one last hurrah and put the deck back together. So I put together Christius Sworn, and it's it's it was so ugly because I'd gotten rid of all of my nice fairy cards. I had like High Rarity Lightsworn, and then like super oranges super christias you know like i had starter deck sold purities were before i had champion pack ones the they were still commons but they're champion pack and i actually start winning with that deck i'm doing pretty good in friendlies versus my friends did play a little bit of db ladder and my first run <clears throat> being back on Christia Sworn was at a turn a uh, store called Collectors Cove in Gastonia, I believe, somewhere in North Carolina. And that was a PlayStation 5 event. And I get paired up against Connor round one, who is BK Kids Club, if that sounds familiar. He literally invented the Gemini deck that we've come to all know and love. And I thought to myself, wow, I've already lost this before it's even started. And I actually win 2-0 against him. And that was a confidence booster because Connor's an excellent player. And I was like, wow, you know, this, this deck's actually really crazy. So I go on, I play a few more rounds. I end up losing to my buddy Cole, who was on GB, after I deck out in game three. That's how down to the wire this match was. And then I lose to my friend Mitchell. <clears throat> I was stalling him out with a Marshmallow, but he had Mark of the Rose. He was playing Amaryllis. So fortunately, I come in and I get ninth place. And that really stinks when you bubble out in ninth. I'm always saying I'm like the bubble king. But yet again, here I go from playing Christia Sworn in Pennsylvania earlier in the year and bombing to getting ninth place. So that's a win-win. You know, now I'm just like, okay, the deck's not bad. So it's not the deck, it's the player. Those are famous words because Fraser Smith actually said that to my friend Justin Perkins uh, after the BBG 2K Justin didn't do quite so hot with the Swedish black wing list. And Fraser was like, it's the deck. It's, it's, it's the player, uh, not the deck. And I always remembered that. Like if I'm playing a deck that is tier one and I'm like, oh man, this deck sucks. This deck's terrible. I'm like, it's not the deck. It's the player. And you can fix the way the player plays. And that's really important. That's a good lesson. <clears throat> so I keep on playing Christia. And I think I get like top four at a Switch tournament with Christia Sworn. Uh, I end up losing to Black Wings in the finals, which is just unfortunately the story for anyone that's ever played Christia Sworn. You know how bad the Black Wing matchup is. But my confidence is just really, really high <clears throat> at this point. I'm like, wow, this deck is busted. I'm so glad that I stopped being belligerent and actually realized how good Christia Sworn actually is. So YCS Richmond rolls around and... I go in with zero expectations, right? So I go into the tournament and I'm just like, you know, I've been on a little bit of a roll here, slowly climbing, slowly climbing and play my first few rounds. And I still think back to round one when I played Jarrett Zimmerman, who's a really cool guy. I keep up with him on Facebook now. And I have absolutely no idea how I managed to beat him. He was on like um, Hero Beat. Stun with D-Fissure. I think he might have even had Macro Cosmos in there. Royal Oppression, Skilled Rain. Have no idea how I beat him, but I did. Excellent match. Really cool guy. And then I played against my buddy Justin Baker on Hero Frogs so the next round. And it just went on and on and on. And before I knew it, I was like, I was seventh seat after Swiss. And that was an insane feeling. I could have actually been much higher had my friend Tom Mack not ruined my dreams with Neo Space and Grand Mole, but that's for another episode, which we're going to have Tom Mack on at some point in the future. And I'm immediately going to bring up how much I hate Grand Mole. But seventh seat after Swiss at a YCS Ultimate Time Wizard. I was ecstatic that night. And I had a few other friends that managed to make it into the quote unquote top 16. My buddy Cameron Saunders was 16th place. We're all excited, and then they're like, oh, no, it's top eight. And I was like, I immediately went and looked because my anxiety was like, oh, no, what if I got ninth place? You know, like, and I checked, and it was seventh, so I'm good. I'm good. I made it into the top eight. <clears throat> so now I'm just like, wow, 
Now I really just don't care what happens tomorrow because to go from bombing every tournament I play into getting top eight at an ult ultimate time wizard, that's a big leap. It's a very big leap. So I go to sleep that night, wake up the next morning, find out I'm playing against Black Wings, and I'm just like, oh man, well, it was a nice run. And I actually end up winning 2 1 against Black Wings. And I go in into the top four, and I play against James Ark, and unfortunately, I kind of did some dumb things in our match. I orange light into Substitute instead of waiting for Colacanth, but that's okay. So he got me. Um, then I play against Tom Mack for third and fourth place, and he gets me yet again with Grand Mole, Dream Crusher. But yeah, so top four at an Ultimate Time Wizard after I had bombed every tournament I'd played in earlier that year. Absolutely insane to be where I was. So I leave that tournament with a... Super Nimble Mega Hamster top eight play mat and just a buttload of confidence. So now I'm like, okay, now I know I can get here. How do I stay here? So I go to, uh, I actually go to a PS5 tournament at uh, Easy Gaming and I actually don't do that well. It's like sometimes these smaller ones I don't do that great at. I don't know why they're like freaking cursed or something. Didn't really do that well there. And I think there might have been another Switch tournament in there somewhere. I don't know, these all run together. I've been to so many events this year. But eventually, the BBG 5K creeps up on us. And this was a tournament I was actually going to test this really crazy Christia Sworn list I'd been brewing. And uh, I was actually going to play Ultimate Offering in Christia Sworn with like Triple Celestia and um, Graganith and all those guys. Because I thought the Ultimate Offering would just be a good way to make those all monster hands just do something. But eventually my friend Blake talked me out of doing that. I just decided to stick to the proven formula because I did want to do well at the 5K. If I had, if I didn't care, I probably would have just played that. But I was like, you know, this is a pretty good chunk of change on the line here. Top eight, um, top 16, at least guaranteed $150. And it goes up from there. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to build <clears throat> around the strong points of my deck from YCS Richmond. So I realized that like the strongest cards are like resolving multiple Celestias, having multiple Lylas. So I go up to playing triple Celestia and triple Lila in the deck, and it was phenomenal throughout that whole tournament run. And I end up, uh, I lose to, let's see, I have to think back and think about it. I lose to Black Wings, which was ultimately the guy that won, and I lost to my buddy Adam. So I finish... X2 on day one. I'm like, man, please let me make top 16. And I come in 15th place. So just by the skin of my butt cheeks, I'm in there. Then I play the next day against my friend Michael Gammons, Mayberry. Excellent, excellent player in GOAT format as well as Edison format. And play against him. And I actually beat him. And I was, at that point, I was like, man, this is crazy. Like, the deck is really just popping off. Like, the Swarns are sworn in today. You know, I'm really just going off. And then, a nightmare. I end up playing against a Christia Sworn mirror match in top eight. And this matchup, if you've never played it, it's very unhinged. It is both players doing whatever the heck they want and getting massively punished by Herald of Orange Light because you don't know if they have Orange Light. You might know if they have Orange Light if they add it back off Beckoning or add it back off Christia. But you're still going to have to do your normal Light Sworn moves. You're still going to have to summon JD. You're still going to have to summon Christia. You're still going to have to use Lumina, whatever, Raikou. And Orange Light is just always a threat. So his name was Jeffrey Gray. He was a really cool guy. He's a very cool opponent to play against. And I end up beating him in game three. So now I'm in top four yet again. I get paired up against the same Blackwing player that beat me in Swiss, and he 2 owes me again. He was the only person to 2 owe me throughout my tournament run, and he did it twice. So, fourth place, BBG 5K, get $500 in cash, get a top eight play mat with Black Rose, and I get a top eight metal pin, which if you saw the deck profile, you've seen all that stuff already. <clears throat> so now I look back, and like a year ago, I bombed every tournament I played in, and I've gotten top eight at the last two big events I've been to. Absolutely just huge confidence boost. And now I'm able to look back and think about almost every game I played throughout the last year and realize why I won them or why I lost them. 
And there were a lot more losses in the beginning, as you've heard, than wins. And I can think back and I actually understand why I lost those. And it was because I actually just hadn't accumulated the fundamental knowledge of Yu-Gi-Oh! and how to actually be good at Yu-Gi-Oh! In Yu-Gi-Oh!, sometimes your deck will just do the work for you. If you play throughout a tournament run and you open Whirlwind Shura every hand and you win every die roll, you're not really having to do a lot of piloting. You're kind of just playing the cards that you're just given. You're not really playing them in any certain way because Every deck in Edison can non-game you sometimes, especially a deck like Vayu Turbo or Black Wings. But eventually, you're going to need the fundamental knowledge of how to actually play Yu-Gi-Oh! And sometimes I would find myself in these situations where I'd been in playing advanced for so long that I would set up an quote-unquote unbreakable field or a quote-unquote auto-win field and then get into these situations where I actually have to interact with my opponent and not know how to actually interact with them at all because I was so used to making an unbreakable field. My opponent either just plays one card and I negate it and they scoop or they just scoop outright. So I never actually got to play those games and learn how to interact with my opponent. So that brings us to the main topic of this podcast episode. I'm sorry, I had to give you a lot of backstory for literally any of this to make any sense. But how did I actually get better at Yu-Gi-Oh? How did I actually improve and start winning? And by no means, guys, am I some pro player. I still think that after the BBG 5K, I will tell people that I think that I'm good at Yu-Gi-Oh. I had never felt like I was good at the game. Even after topping a 2K, even after winning a couple switches, even after getting top four at YCS Richmond, I never felt like I was good. I always was like thinking about, well, am I actually good or did I just have a good run? Did I just have a good run? And now I've had enough good runs. I'm like, okay, well, if, if I'm playing the casino and doing this well, I need to stop playing Yu-Gi-Oh and start gambling. But I actually think that I am good at Yu-Gi-Oh now, and I can admit that. Not in a, a gloaty way, but I do feel like I'm actually good at Yu-Gi-Oh. So I have <clears throat> a ton of topics in my phone on how to get better at the game that I have just kind of accumulated from across the board from multiple content creators. This is from people like A True Hero. It's from people like E3, I Am Nerd, James Art, Cameron Saunders, Beast Mode, Times 2. The list just goes on and on and on and on. And there's too many to actually name and quote all of these quotes that I have. But, um, you know you'll probably be able to tell where a lot of them come from. But the first step in improving an Edison format is very, very simple. It'll take you 30 seconds. You need to go and subscribe to I Am Nerd. You need to subscribe to A True Hero, E3 Yu-Gi-Oh!, James Ark the Professor, Cameron Saunders, and of course, the Edison Club. And there's a lot more out there that you can subscribe to as well. You have people like Carpath out there. You have Zuxid, who does the cursed tech videos. He's hilarious. There are a lot more out there. That's just a few. So any of the big name players that also have a YouTube following, go and subscribe to them. And don't just subscribe to them. Watch their content. Watch all of their content. Watch it multiple times. Okay. Frazier Smith has a side decking video where it's like 45 minutes of him just going over how to side deck and how to side deck properly. And I actually revisit that video before every major tournament run just so that information is fresh on my mind. I do it after or before every big tournament. I don't do them for small ones, but for anything, YCS, you know, 5Ks, whatever, I rewatch that every time. I'll just put it on, on, listen to it through my AirPods while I'm at work, and I want that fresh on my mind. A True Hero has these segments called Kaiba Talks, where he actually goes through and tells you how to beat every top deck that there is. And a lot of times he actually gets on the player that's known the most for that deck. Like he had 10 foot on for Vayu Turbo. He had Hydro Pump on for Dragon Turbo. He has the players that are known for those decks telling you how to beat those decks. They are 100% golden videos and you need to be listening to them and you need to listen to them multiple times. The information is there. It's actually the most low hanging fruit you'll ever see. You just have to reach up and take it. And if you don't want to reach up and take it, you don't want to get better. 
So you have to do that. And then James Ark, obviously, is James Ark. He's responsible for making so many decks in the format. He's an incredible player, an incredible deck builder. Cameron Saunders, who does these videos of him playing RuneScape, but he also talks about the game as well. And he has a lot of good insight in the game. And I've watched all of those, and I'm really excited for episode 420 because he just did episode 69. So that'll be a good episode. <clears throat> okay, so that's something that you can do literally anytime. You're cooking dinner, headphones on, listen to Frasier. Cooking dinner, headphones on, listen to a true hero. On the toilet, headphones on, listen to Cameron Saunders. Okay, so very simple advice there. And you'll, well, after you listen to a lot of those, you'll start to realize where a lot of these notes I have for you came from. The next topic I have is take notes after every game. Obviously, sometimes you can't take notes in game. And I'm not talking about like trap write down your opponent's hand off a trap dust. I'm talking about take real notes after every game. And if you can take notes, if the tournament you're playing in allows that, you can do this during your match. If you lose game one, you need to analyze why you lost game one. If you threw the match because you just did something stupid, okay? You just did something dumb. You targeted the wrong black wing with Sirocco. You knew he had mirror force and you forgot. Then that's just a problem on you and you can fix that. Because I promise if you dust shoot and forget they have mirror force and you run in for five and you get mirror force, you will never do that crap again. And if it's something that you just did wrong, do take note of that. Okay? If it's something, if your opponent just God handed you, which is going to happen, you know, if your opponent opens up Dust Shoot, Stratos, Future Fusion, Miracle Fusion, this insane, and you never stood a chance, then write that down. You know, like that's not a loss that you really could do anything differently about. If you're playing and you realize that you made a very bad misplay in the middle of the game and that just kind of made the game spiral out of your control, take note of that. Take note of why you lost. Also, something that a lot of people do not do is take note of why you won. Did you have a good win? Did you outplay your opponent and you did what you should have done? Or did you not really win what I would call well, in quotations here? So if you just win because you did a play that was so terrible, but it just worked out for you, it might have worked out for you this time, but in the long run, if you keep doing that, it's probably not going to work out for you that well. So keep track of your wins whether they're good wins or bad wins, and try to learn things from your wins as well as your losses. People always say, well, you learn nothing from a win, but you learn from a loss. I actually don't think that's true. I think you can learn a lot from a win. I think that you need to try to learn how to win correctly and learn the best way that you can to win. I think that's very important as well. You know, if you accidentally give your opponent another turn, if you didn't, and I've actually done this many times, if you didn't stack a card for Plague Spreader, and attack with everything, and they're randomly left at 400, and they got another turn, and then you win the next turn, I consider that a bad win, because that's a game that you very well could have lost. Like, they should have not gotten that other turn, and they got it. Also, too, we'll get to this part later, but let's just say that my opponent is at 3,400, and I attack with Judgment Dragon, and I pass. Then I look down and realize that Plague Spreader is in my graveyard. I could have killed them, and they draw... And they draw like an absolute bomb card, right? Like, let's say they draw their own Judgment Dragon and they kill me. I can no longer say, wow, they sacked me because I gave them an extra turn. They shouldn't have had. that. That's a loss. It's my fault. It's not a sack. It was my fault. So analyze your losses. They keep me up at night. I can't tell you how many times that I've lost in a tournament run. And three or four days later, I just think about it. I'm like, wow, I, I threw that match. Funniest one is I lost to my buddy Cody Hug at a Switch tournament. And I can't even remember what it was now, but I know that three days later I was taking the trash out and I immediately realized why I lost that game. And I called him and I was like, I know why I lost our match. And this man had to think that I was just absolutely crazy when I called him three days after a tournament run and be like, I know why I lost to you. But that crap keeps me up at night. And I actually randomly the other day thought about how I could have potentially won against Cameron Saunders in the 2K earlier this year, 2-0 instead of 2-1, and it was a play that was very simple. I activated, he had double dupe frog, Stardust Dragon. I had Judgment Dragon in my hand, so obviously I can't summon it and attack because he has dupe frog. So I go, brain control your Stardust Dragon, and he says, that's fine. He looks at my grave, and he's like, it res, I'll crow one of your names. 
And I was like, you know, that really sucks because I only had four. And in hindsight, had I just went summon Judgment Dragon, play Brain Control, the game is just over. The game just ends from there because DD Crow no longer does anything. At the end phase, I'm just going to mill four more names or four more cards. And, you know, eventually that crow just becomes less and less of a threat. But because of the order I played them in, the DD Crow was actually just an OTK against me, and I completely lost because of it. And I just randomly thought about that the other day. So as you start to improve, you're going to think back to when you weren't that great and think about how just simple little things that you did incorrectly ended up costing you games that you should have won. Uh, my next tip here is going to be to stick to one deck. And also, make sure that it's a deck that's an A tier or higher. You know, you can be the best Morphtronic player that there is in Edison format, and you're probably still not going to do that well. You are going to win from time to time, but you're not going to have the same results as if you played a deck like Vayu Turbo, or Black Wings, or Hero Frog, or Diva Hero. So it's very important that the deck that you pick is a tier 1 deck. So stick to one deck. You need to get in reps. Reps, a lot of reps. Not 10 games, okay, not 20 games. You need to play hundreds of games with the same deck. You need to basically get to a point where there is no situation that you get put in that you have not been in before, so that way you know how to navigate it. And I think that's the same across every Yu-Gi-Oh! format. If you play enough games against enough decks, you're going to get put in the same situation enough times where you're like, I'm not making the same mistake again. And then sometimes you're just going to lose to, to the variance of Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, sometimes you'll be like, I've been in this situation a hundred times. I know exactly what to do. But your opponent might have two DD Crows instead of one. And that's just the variance. But if you stick to that and you learn and you get the reps in and you know what to do in every scenario, you're going to win more games by knowing what to do than you lose because your opponent just kind of had everything for what you had. So... Literally play hundreds of games with the same deck. And I actually would argue that you need to um, be playing with the same list, actually. If you're trying to test a list, you may not need 100 games with the same list, but you haven't fully tested a deck or a card in your deck until around the 20 match mark. Because I could throw Megamorph into my Light Sworn deck right now, go JD Megamorph attack for 6,000 and win, and be like, oh my god, this card's absolutely insane. This is definitely, people are sleeping on this. This is so stupid. And then have another tournament run, that card be absolutely terrible, because I didn't actually test the card. I feel like after the 20 match mark, you can start to kind of make decisions on, is this card good? Is this card bad? Should this card be at 2 in my deck? Should it be at 1? Should it be at 3? Should I not play it at all? Because you're not gathering from information. Back on the topic of Megamorph, if I put Megamorph in my Christia Sworn deck, and the first game I play with it, I beat my opponent with it. Megamorph has a 100% win rate in my Christius Sworn deck. 100%. And that's not actually factual because I haven't played enough games with it to actually determine if that card is good or not. So when you're trying out techs, you really need to be grinding those and you really need to be playing those a lot. That way you can determine whether or not you're just kind of getting lucky with them or if it's actually good. So that's really important. And you need to be playing with a wide range of players. It's Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game that's for fun. It's really fun to get with your boys on a Friday night, play some Yu-Gi-Oh!, have some laughs. And those are the nights that I live for. But if you're only playing against players at your own skill level, you'll never get any better. You have to play against players that are better than you. Sometimes I'll hear people at locals, especially in advanced locals, say like, oh, I don't want to play against that guy, I'll lose. He's so good, I don't want to play against him. And you have to play against those players. Yes, sometimes the, the really good players aren't pleasant. That's just a well-known fact about Yu-Gi-Oh! But some of them are really, really, really nice and really cool. I'm so lucky that I get to share locals with players like Raikoko, Cameron, Hydro Pump, Frog Slicer. They all go to Big Boy Gaming. Even Frazier comes down to Big Boy Gaming sometimes. I get to play against these guys. And they're all like the Edison format goats of the format and they'll all give you advice they'll help you you know they they actually want players to get better and that's really awesome you know to see players like that want to just help you and just see the community grow i think that's something that advanced format is actually lacking a lot in 
And you need to also join a Discord for your deck. There's like the Format Library Discord. There's the EdisonFormat.com Discord where there's like, it's broken down into like every archetype all the way from like A tier all the way down to like random rogue decks. And you need to be in that Discord because you need to be with people that are also sharing their own ideas for the deck. And you could find something that you didn't already know. Or you could tell somebody something that they didn't know. And you, it's just really nice to be in that community. So like I'm in the Light Sworn Discord. It's like the Discord I'm the most active in. People always post their lists in there and share stuff, new text they've found, stuff like that. So um, I am going to link some of those videos in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. And I think that I can do that on Apple and Spotify as well. But I'll link like Fraser's side decking guide and a link to his podcast. I'll link the True Hero Kaiba Talks, probably just one of them because you can find the rest in there. I'll link Cameron Saunders Talks and James Ark actually just came out with a video about coaching. I'll link that as well. Um, <clears throat> we're actually into the quotations, um, po uh, the point in this podcast, where we're going to start talking about these quotations here. We're actually moving along really well. It's only been 35 minutes and we're halfway done. I thought this would be me old man rambling for at least a couple hours, but nonetheless, here we are. So important quotations here. And these are what I talk about the fundamentals of Yu-Gi-Oh that no one talks about and no one mentions and the first one I have here is to make your opponent change the game state. You don't have to change the game state. Make them change the game state. This is something that when I heard it, and I can tell you it was Frazier that said this, because it absolutely blew my freaking mind how no one had ever said that to me. 20, 20 plus years of playing Yu-Gi-Oh! I had never heard anyone say that in my life. And it makes so much sense. If I have a Stratos and an Alias on the field and you draw for turn set one, you better have Mirror Force because I'm not summoning into your Torrential Tribute. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to attack you for 18 and 19 until you either die or you have to start setting your monsters face down to just live. So make your opponent change the game state. If you're winning, right? If I have three monsters and you have one set card, there's no reason for me to summon an Ocean and get torrential for four. Just keep attacking. Make your opponent change the game state. And that's just such a good fundamental rule of Yu-Gi-Oh across the board. And definitely remember that because there are so many times where I want to slip back into old ways when I'm playing and just kind of want to just go all in. I'm like, I'm going to make them change the game state. If they're playing slow and I'm playing fast, they're going to have to catch up to me or I'm just going to win naturally anyway because I'm playing fast and they're playing slow. So that's really important. The next one here is everyone's heard about reads in Yu-Gi-Oh. You might have a read that your opponent has Starlight Road. If it's sat there for a long time, it's never been flipped. You've summoned a monster with 1,800 attacks, so you know it's not bottomless. You've summoned two monsters at the same time, uh, so you know it's not torrential. You've attacked with multiple monsters, so you know it's not mirror force. It goes on and on and on. You've special summoned, so you know it's not real oppression. You could probably read that that card is something like Starlight Road. So stick to your reads. Don't change your read. If you have a read that they have mirror force, don't just decide the next turn. Oh, haha, ha. better have Mirror Force, I'm going to attack. Stick to your reads. We kind of lightly touched on this one earlier, but don't give your opponent more turns than you have to. And what I mean is I'll give you a good example here. And this one actually didn't work out for me, but I was playing, or I'm sorry, actually this does work out for me. Um, I was playing a match against Hero Frogs at YCS Richmond, and I have Judgment Dragon and Christia on the field. And my opponent has one set card, and I need to summon the Jane in my hand to be able to actually get enough damage to kill him that turn. So I have a read that he has something like Regeki Break on the field. That's what he said. So I'm like, I need to summon another monster so that no matter what he Regeki Breaks, he still dies. Um, so I summon the Jane. I didn't believe that he had Torrential. I go to Battle Phase. I attack with Judgment Dragon. He has Regeki Break. He Regeki Breaks my Christia. He takes 3,000 and he summons Gores in defense. So he's left at 800. So what I end up doing is I call the Haunted back my Gragonith and then pierce over the Gores for game. Now some people might would say, like, why did you not just JD blow up the field? And that's because, this is kind of actually going back into the don't change your reads topic, but that's because I had a read that he had Regeki Break. So, what happens if I JD nuke the field? Pay a thousand, he changed Regeki Break, 
hits my JD, and all of a sudden, oh, excuse me, all of a sudden, my entire field is gone because he had Regeki break. So I, I stuck to that read. Now, the previous game before that, I had Judgment Dragon Christie on the field. He set one card and passed. And yet again, when you play against Hero Frogs, they play triple Regeki break or triple wind blast, or some form of those, some ratio, I attacked, and he had mirror force. And sometimes that's just going to happen. It was more likely that it was Regeki break than mirror force. And that's just Yu-Gi-Oh. Sometimes that's just going to happen. So stick to your reads, don't change them, and don't give your opponent more turns than they have to. Don't forget that you have Plague Spread in your graveyard. You need to stack a card and get that extra 400 in. Don't let them get extra turns. I don't like playing decks, personally that allow my opponent to get a lot of turns. Like, I'm not, like, this player that likes to grind out these games and have all these interactions. I like stuff like Light Sworn, I summon JD, I nuke the field, summon Christia. I like decks like Diva Hero, where I like decks that you have a push turn, that it's like, eventually, I get to this turn where I'm like, I'm winning this turn, and you better have something insane or you lose. I don't like for my opponent to get an absurd amount of turns, because I always felt like they would outplay me because they were better than me. Maybe that's not the case anymore, but I don't like to give them extra turns. Learn to side deck. A helpful tip here is when you're siding, what I will do is if, let's say I'm playing against Hero Frogs and I'm playing Light Sworn, before I even pick up my side deck to see what's in there, right? I will go through my main deck and take out the cards that are bad against Hero Frogs. Stuff like Heavy Storm, Stuff like Royal Decree, if you're main decking Royal Decree. Any cards that are not good in that matchup, I immediately take them out. I put them to the side. Then I pick up my side. And I'm like, okay, what do I have for this matchup? And let's just say it's a random matchup you have nothing for. You go through your side and you say, what cards do I have that are better than the cards I took out? <clears throat> if you're side decking even something like a Snowman Eater, right? Snowman Eater will probably have more value against Hero Frogs than a heavy storm ever will. Because at least Snowman Eater one for ones with AZ or gets over Vanity's Fiend or whatever. So it might have more synergy with your deck than a heavy storm. So <clears throat> that's my side decking philosophy nowadays is I don't want dead cards in my deck. And if I have dead cards in my deck, I at least want them to be less dead than stuff like Heavy Storm or Royal Decree because you'll never really get any value out of those cards. I mean, can you imagine if you go heavy for one, and then they just chain their wind blast. Like, you're going to feel really silly. So, <clears throat> learn to side deck, and do not, under any circumstances, touch your engine cards. This was another problem that I was having with Christia Sworn, was I was siding out cards like Aaron, like, oh, Hero Beat, they don't set any cards, I don't need Aaron. This deck, blah, 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 I don't need these cards, I don't need this, I don't need Christia. And I was actually handicapping myself, because I was taking out names. And I was like, wow, it's getting really hard to summon Judgment Dragon. Now, there are exceptions to that. Like, if you're playing Triple Lila, you could side one out against Hero Frogs, and it's not really going to change anything. But when I play Light Sworn, I don't like to side out my one of names. Like, I don't want to side out Aaron. I don't want to side out Arcus. I don't really want to side out any of my one of cards. Another exception to the rule is, like, if you play against Black Wings, I put in Royal Decrees. So a lot of times I'll take out my Glorious Illusions because they're not that great with World Decree. And inadvertently, I no longer want Gragoneth in my deck without um, Glorious Illusion because it's, it's just a tribute summon at that point. So there are exceptions to it, but just make sure if you are taking out engine cards that it makes sense of the cards that you're taking out. And that might be something that you kind of have to just do trial by fire and a little at a time, just kind of learn. But... You know, if you're playing zombies, you're not signing out your Plague Spreader. You're not signing out your Goblin Zombies. You're not signing out your Zombie Master. You're not signing out your Pyramid Turtles. If you're on some weird zombie list that plays like Triple Tomato, you might could say, okay, I can take out one Tomato, and it's not going to change anything. Just make sure you know how to side and how to side deck properly. <clears throat> Once again, we kind of talked about this earlier, but... Learn the difference in getting sacked and having an actual loss. Sometimes you do get sacked, and it's just, it just happens because it's Yu-Gi-Oh. Your opponent opens Stratos, Future Fusion, Dust Shoot, Miracle Fusion, all this crazy stuff, and you just got blown out of the game before you ever got started. But remember the example I gave earlier, my opponent's at 3,400, 
I get too trigger happy, I summon JD and attack for 3,000. And then in my end phase, I realize, oh, I had Plague Spreader. Oh, I guess it'll be fine. And then they draw their own JD and kill me. And I say, oh, haha, you're such a sack. But in reality, I threw the game away when I didn't attack with Plague Spreader Zombie. So you need to learn the difference in getting sacked and having an actual loss. And that's going to help you a lot. That kind of goes back into like the whole analyze your losses kind of thing. And sometimes you don't actually have to win every game. Sometimes your opponent will just lose the game. And that's also just a part of Yu-Gi-Oh. Like I have won games that I had absolutely no business in winning. And my opponent just unfortunately threw the game. Like they chose not to use uh, some effect that they had. They forgot about it. They, they knew I had Mirror Force and they just attacked into it anyway. And I was able to come back and win. They DD crowed the wrong card. Sometimes you just don't have to win every game. Sometimes you just have to hope that your opponent loses the game. I always say that, you know, if you're not winning, if you feel like you can't win, you can just hope your opponent's an idiot. And that goes both ways because sometimes your opponent might be thinking the same thing and then you throw and they're like, oh, I didn't win. My opponent was just an idiot. So, yeah, just remember that. Also, an important piece of information here is your opponent did not draw the out off the top of the deck. I have seen so many times a player will just give their opponent an absurd amount of turns when there was no reason to. So a good example here is let's just say your opponent hasn't really done much in a few turns and you have some big guys on the field. You have AZ, you have Gaia, you have Neos Alias, you know, stuff like that. So many times I've seen their opponent draw, set a card, and then their opponent's like, oh no, you know, I have to go into rat in the corner mode put all my guys in defense and start attacking for 1900 instead of attacking for game. So you have to remember that cards like Mirror Force and Torrential, they are very high impact, but they are both limited to one. So if you always play like they always have Mirror Force, all you're going to be doing is just giving them more turns to see Mirror Force. If I sit there and I have game on the field, let's just say I have four monsters. I can put two of those in defense if I want to if I'm really that scared of Mirror Force, but I've actually seen people put like, leave one in attack mode and they just start this thing where they're just gonna attack for 1900 every turn. And it turns out their opponent just set an MST and they end up coming back and winning just because their opponent was too scared of Mirror Force. It's a very important um, rule of thumb to just say, say to yourself, my opponent did not draw the out off the top of the deck. And sometimes it's gonna happen. It's just Yu-Gi-Oh! And sometimes it's not. Play Heavy Storm. Literally activate it. I have seen so many people over the course of playing Edison format go draw heavy and their hand is insane. They're like, oh my gosh, I could kill them this turn. But they have Starlight Road set. So they don't play the Heavy Storm. They try to do this weird thing where they're like, I'll just grind you down a little bit at a time and then I'll Heavy Storm you for one. And at that point, don't even play Heavy Storm. Take, take it out of your deck. You put that card in your deck because you're going to activate Heavy Storm. You have no idea how many times I've went activate heavy and hit four back row because they had prote protection because they think that you won't activate it because they're kind of representing they have storm or they have judgment. And that goes back to the theory of like, you better have it or you lose. And sometimes they're going to have it. Sometimes you're going to summon JD, use prior and they have Starlight Road. And you know, that those are kind of all very similar. Like I play judgment dragon to use the effect to destroy the field and attack for game. I don't, play Judgment Dragon to summon it and use it as a beater and attack into your D-Prison because I thought it was Starlight Road, but it's actually D-Prison. Play the cards the way that they're supposed to be played. Now, sometimes a card like Celestia, you can kind of play around stuff like Rogue because you can just pop one. Like, if there's one problem card, you can say, okay, I'll hit one back row, then I'll try to swing over your monster because I do feel like you have Starlight Road. And obviously, there's a caveat to everything. If you've trapped dust shooted your opponent and you know they have Road, you're probably not going to play heavy until you can deal with Stardust. If your opponent accidentally drops their Starlight Road on the field, you're probably not going to play heavy. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that card is in your deck because it's Heavy Storm. It's supposed to blow up back row. So, literally, activate Heavy Storm. It is so important. Just play your cards. The last thing I have here on the list, and I can't believe that we're at 50 minutes. I really thought this was going to go on for hours, but... No amount of theory is going to make you better or help you improve. It does not matter how good you are at Yu-Gi-Oh! Theory, how much you theorize, how much this deck should work in theory. You have 
to play. You absolutely, you have to play games. You have to get reps in. You have to test. And this was something that I was also very hurt by was because I would say, oh, I don't have to play Yu-Gi-Oh. I can just think about it. I can just theory. I can just build a deck purely off of theory and it will perform well. That's just not the case. Maybe that's the case in advanced where the numbers are much more calculated and the decks are much more consistent. And you can actually like sit down and think like mathematically, what are the odds in drawing this, 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 and this, and how it all works together. The Edison format as a whole is pretty inconsistent. So you're not going to have consistent results in your theory. So you have to actually test those theories. You have to test these crazy decks that you build. You have to test these crazy techs that you put in your deck. And sometimes you can have a tournament run and you say, okay, I'm going to throw in this card and see how it does. Um, I've told people about um, Suzuki Samurai, number two, how I played that card at YCS Richmond. I didn't really test that card um, going into Richmond, but I knew that I was going to play Rota anyway, and I knew I was going to play one for one anyway for Consecrated Light. So having that little guy as a secondary target, the theory did work out there. But for the most part, you want to make sure that you're actually testing your decks, testing out your tech, and seeing how it works, and gathering real results, not just trying to theory everything. Because theory, theory will get you nowhere. Theory might get you somewhere, like I said, in, in advance, but you need raw time playing, you need raw time deck building and testing. So, 51 minutes. It's really not bad. I really did not think that it was going to go this quickly, but it did. So I thought that people would really enjoy listening to something like this, especially on a holiday weekend where people are traveling, they're on planes, they're in cars on long car rides, they're sitting off at the side, eating some turkey or some ham, not wanting to be around their drunk uncle. So, you know, you might want to listen to how you can get better at Edison. And obviously, nothing is an absolute when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! There are thousands of ways to get better at Yu-Gi-Oh! that I don't know about yet, that I'm sure this time next year, I'll be saying, wow, I was an idiot in December of 2023. Look at how bad I was. And... Yeah, I think that's just life. I think the longer it goes on, the more people you talk to, the more you learn, and the more you get to look back and say, wow, I really I really came a long way in where I'm at. So hope that you guys enjoyed this. This was something I wanted to do for a long time and something I debated doing because part of me was like, it took me so long to learn all of these things. Do I really feel like I want to just lump all of this up in one video just for any, any old Tom, Dick, or Harry to go listen to? But I really wanted to because I really... I don't want people to have to sit around and wonder if they're good enough. Why are they not winning when some of this information is hard to find? But once again, as a closing statement, all of those videos are going to be linked in the description below. All of those guys' channels, you need to go and check out all their content. You need to watch all their videos. Even if, if you're a big, like let's just say you're a big Light Sworn guy, right? And you're like, you see a new video and get posted, a true hero posted a video. It's him playing Diva Hero versus Black Wings. You're like, oh, this, uh, this isn't Light Sworn. Why do I care to watch this? You can still learn things from it. You can still learn how to interact with your opponent, even if it's a different deck. Because sometimes decks have very similar things that they can do, like Celestia. Um, it's kind of similar to like a Gladiator Beast Gazares type card popping too. It's kind of like a little monarch, so... Even if the deck isn't exactly your deck, there's still things that you can learn just from watching them because they might say something important throughout the video. And then you say, wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty crazy. And I still do that myself. If I watch videos from time to time, I'll be like, wow, I actually didn't know that this card interaction worked this way. Or I didn't know how this worked or this method of thinking and this read here was really good. I need to remember that. So thank you guys for listening. This is Mike from the Edison Club. Signing out until the next one. Best of luck on your own individual Yu Gi Oh! Edison format journeys. Mm -hmm.